name is Larissa and I'm the new Communications Coordinator at the Sydney Mathematical Research Institute. Today I'm interviewing Dr Jared Field, who will be visiting Semri in March as part of the Domestic Visitor Program. Jared has been a postdoc at the University of Melbourne since January 2020 and he's broadly interested in the intersection of mathematics, ecology and evolutionary biology. Jared completed his undergrad maths degree at the University of Sydney, followed by his doctoral studies at the University of Oxford. He's actually no stranger to the Institute. In fact, Jared attended the launch of Semri back in November 2018, and we're very excited for him to return as a visiting researcher. So Jared, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Could you start by telling us about your research interests? So my research interests are actually quite diverse. They fall broadly under, I guess, the umbrella term of mathematical biology and, and using maths to try and understand questions in evolution. But more specifically, I'm, I'm interested in human longevity, uh, why we live so long post-menopause. I guess using maths to try and understand that and theories around that. But also other things like, for example, how do animals deal with risk? How can we use maths to get the most out of, uh, I guess, experiments around risk with animals because you know, we, we can't really communicate with them in the way that we can with humans. But uh, I'm also doing projects, for example, looking at the mathematics and, I guess, evolutionary biology of indigenous kinship rules. So my, my research interests are sometimes annoyingly quite large, but generally uh, evolutionary biology and, and maths. So would you describe yourself as a mathematical biologist? I think I would, but it is an extremely broad term. Can you tell us about how your research interests sort of connect together? Where do mathematics and these applied fields intersect? Oh, yeah, I think people often are a little uncomfortable talking about maths and biology. We make assumptions about something that may be happening, we turn those assumptions into equations, we ask questions of the equations, uh, and then hopefully there's some data we can test it against to try and gain greater understanding of whatever's happening. Is that quite a challenge in the field of evolution when the time scales are so long? Yes, though it depends on the organism. So for example, uh, many, many studies we look at, we use flies as model organisms and, and mice and whatnot. And for them, the, the generation time is much smaller. So flies are perhaps not the best model organism to approximate humans, right? So overwhelmingly, yes, because at least for me, the, the organisms that I'm interested in tend to be long-lived mammals. And you know, I, I won't live long enough to test these things explicitly, but data does exist. And also I think that's where the power of mathematics comes in, right? Because there are some things we can observe and predict, even if we can't have these traditional sort of control intervention experiments. So tell us about the project that you'll be carrying out at SEMRI. So the project is looking at generalising some of the work that's been done in the past around parent offspring conflicts. So this is work that has been studied at least as early as the 70s with a, a really famous paper by Evelyn Trivers. A good example would be optimal brood size for chicks. For the chicks that are about to be hatched, they will be stronger and more healthy the less number of siblings that are in their brood, right? Whereas the parent may want more to spread more of their genes, right? Or hedging their bets in some sense, right? The parent wants as, as many of its offspring to be healthy and fit as possible, whereas for the individual chicks, that's not true, right? If there's loads of competition with other chicks, it's actually in their interest that some of them die or some of them are pushed out of the nest. Another example is this thing which has always creeped me out immensely called fetal tumorism in humans, where some fetuses, or I guess babies, they leave part of their own DNA in the bodies of their mothers that actually makes their mothers sick after they've been born. The idea being it delays the time between when their next sibling will be born so that more time can be invested in them. So basically my research is trying to, because loads of theoretical work has been done on this, 
and loads of empirical work has been done on this in a whole range of organisms. But I want to generalize it to the interactions between grandparents and grand offsprings, which is only really relevant, I, I think, for us and some of the whales, where you have these really interesting intergenerational transfers going on. Not many people have spent much time thinking about the consequences of conflicts between grandparents and grand offspring, or, or conflicts between all three of those generations. It's not a very general thing, but I still want to understand the general theory behind it um, in the hope of trying to understand the evolution of longevity. Could you explain the concept of the grandmother hypothesis and how it relates to why we live for a period of time post-menopause? It's this really neat idea in evolutionary biology, I think. It essentially says that we we live long because we have grandmothers, not we have grandmothers because we live long. And the idea being, having a, a post-menopausal lifespan is actually very, very bizarre, right? Because the currency of natural selection is the spread of your genes. So to explain this, this idea came about that if the time in which you've increased your lifespan, you can help your own children reproduce again sooner, then the thing that's allowing the spreading of that change should be selected for again, right? So it should increase, increase, increase your, your lifespan post-menopause, despite the fact that you're not reproducing yourself. So you're helping your own children to reproduce again sooner instead of doing it yourself. That's really interesting. And I understand that there's not many species that have long life periods post-menopause apart from humans. Mm, it's very, very interesting. So it's us and some of the toothed whales. So also mammals, but sea mammals, which uh, always, always, always creep me out. And not the great apes. So the great apes don't display this. So if we protect them from external mortality, they do have something like menopause, but they're the exception, not the norm. Whereas for us in, in modern hunter-gatherers, even roughly a third of the population you know, unassisted by modern medicine will live post-menopause. So I understand that game theory comes into this project. This is quite the hot topic at the moment in many, many different research fields. Is this your first foray into game theory? Uh, no, it's not actually. So I did some game theory in my, my PhD at Oxford. And I think it's actually a really, really neat way to approach questions in evolutionary biology. And it has been done for a while now, and I think quite successfully, where we talk about this thing called evolutionary stable strategies. The, the methodologies are essentially the same as regular game theory, I would say, except the thing that we're optimizing is different. So in, in regular game theory, you're optimizing often some abstract utility function. It could be money you receive, it could be whatever. But to talk about regular game theory, often we assume that the, the actors are rational actors. So they're making rational decisions and, and through that rationality, we get optimality. But in evolutionary biology, we don't assume that at all, which is why I think it's very powerful uh, because I don't think we're rational actors. The thing that we assume is maximized is just fitness, right? So the thing we, we talk about in evolutionary biology more generally. So when you say fitness, you're referring to evolutionary success and as opposed to like health and well-being? Yes. So I'm, I mean the relative reproductive output. But of course, the two things that you mentioned could feed into that. So could you tell us about the topic of your PhD thesis? So my, my topic in my PhD thesis was also very broad. So I did a whole bunch of, of smaller projects under the umbrella concept of adaptive inactivity. It's this notion that sometimes it's best to do nothing. Sometimes it's adaptive to do nothing. So for example, I looked at the evolution of sleep. Most theories of sleep assume it's the, the byproduct of some core physiological function or chemistry. Whereas I wanted to ask, okay, that's interesting, but is it the case that sleep as a behavior is perhaps just adaptive? So with finite energy, sometimes it's best to not be doing something. And it turns out it is, right? My thesis was this, this notion of adaptive inactivity, but applied to a whole bunch of different areas of biology. So for example, one project I looked at is this really classic study. Essentially what they did is they gave one bird many, many times over two options. And on 
The left option, they would get a fixed re reward of C or whatever, and this could be like seeds or, or water or sugary water often because they, they really like that. But anyway, on the other one, uh, it's, it's not always certain that they'll get a reward. And with probability P, it's A, with probability one minus P, it's B. So that on average, it's the same. And fascinating experiment because then loads of people said, okay, so this one is more risky. And under these set of conditions, the bird picked the risky option. Therefore, I probably think that that's what is motivating risky behavior on those conditions which makes sense if the organism has the same frame of reference as you, right? So if the organism also knows and believes that the expected rewards are the same, so that I have to use variances to make my decision. But you can show actually that in, in finite time, if the organism is inferring those distributions, they will never agree with you, even that the expected rewards are the same. I guess it was a caution. We need to be careful with precisely what what these experiments can and cannot tell us. You've also studied Indigenous marriage rules from a mathematical perspective. Could you explain how these systems work in Aboriginal societies? Huge topic, huge, huge topic. So the reason I'm studying them is because I'm Gumilere, right? So this is the, the people that come from so northern New South Wales on the border of New South Wales and Queensland. But there is no such thing as an Aboriginal society, right? Because we're extremely, extremely diverse. It's like French to Russian. My people, we have a, a four group system, meaning that for the purpose of marriage, so they have other roles as well, but for the purpose of marriage, people are split into four different class systems. But the consequences of that are that it forces certain restrictions on how closely related your partner may be. And in fact, in a paper I'm writing at the moment, you can show with, it's a bit involved, but it is pen and paper mathematics, that the, in, the entire Gimilaray nation, which is you know, roughly the size of France, would have to reduce just to just 24 individuals so that we, when marrying on average, would be as closely related as first cousins, which is remarkable given that, you know, Charles Darwin married his first cousin on purpose. So a lot of mathematicians, whenever I'm talking about that, Andre Weil from the Bourbaki group, which, is, which was this group of, of mathematicians in France that wrote a whole bunch of things anonymously and as a collective. But it turns out that in a, in a footnote to a book by the anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, that Andre Weil actually carried out an analysis of one of the kinship systems that interests me, which is one from the, the Northern Territory, but in a very, very different way. So he approached it using group theory ideas, whereas I'm using, I guess, probabilistic ideas. But it was, it was really surprising to see that someone else had, had thought about this, you know, a good 100 years ago, but in a slightly different way. So this is quite a, a broad range of research problems. What sort of research attracts you when you're choosing topics to investigate? Oh, that's a very good question. I think my, my previous supervisors probably got quite annoyed at this and wouldn't recommend it, but the thing that motivates the problems I do is purely interest and often questions that just that I think about and then experience day to day, like why do we sleep? That's an odd thing, right? But yeah, pure interest, I guess, which is bad because I should be more strategic. Thinking back to your time as a student, what was the impetus for choosing to study maths? There, there wasn't some like grand, like, oh, I have these huge plans to win a Fields Medal or any of this. It, it was purely just, yeah, I had the aptitude and I enjoyed it. You took part in a program called the Aurora Study Tour in 2014. And could you tell us a bit about the experience? Uh, yeah, so it's this really great program. Essentially, it takes really, really high performing First Nations students and you travel to a whole bunch of cities around the world. All of these great uh, places that have amazing institutions for potential to study postgrad. It was a great, great experience. I was pretty certain that I wanted to go to Oxford. So could you tell us a bit about the experience of completing your PhD at Oxford? 
Do you, your supervisors impart you with any particular wisdom or advice that stuck with you? That's a very good question. One supervisor was very, very explicit in that as a mathematical biologist, it's all well and good to think about these problems theoretically, but he said, where your career goes from here is really a function of the biologist, right? Like if you don't have any data to falsify all of the things that you're thinking about, then your work will not have all that much value, right? So the data you have access to will make or break your career eventually, which I think is very, very good advice to be thinking about. Like it's important to think very theoretically, I think, but like we must have interaction with the people who can say that we're wrong. And I guess the other one is it probably wasn't advice, but I think I gleaned a bit of wisdom off him in the sense that one of my supervisors was a very, very big dog in math bio generally, but also at Oxford. And he just worked so hard, so, so hard. I would often go to the office on weekend and he was always there. And I think what I learned from that was that that is not what I want. I think, really, I think too many academics, they just give too much of themselves to the career. And while it's very good to be passionate, you know, like we have to be more than this. I would much rather be a, a mediocre academic that has other interests and you know, more of a life than a superb academic that can only talk about my one thing. I think some academics feel the pressure to be a sort of very unidimensional being. Mm, exactly, exactly. I do not want to age like spoiled milk. Are you working on developing any new skills at the moment? Yes. So I'm currently supervising an extremely talented vacation scholar and it is my first time I guess being on the other end of you know this, this supervisor supervisee relationship and it's it's nothing that I think is ever taught in in academia right like how to actually be a good teacher so I guess at the moment a, a skill I'm trying to make better is is my own supervising behaviors and techniques and like I just I don't want to be a dodgy supervisor you know